good afternoon everyone and greetings to all of you from different joint time zones who are joining us for day 5 and the session on ai governance and institutional mechanism for collaboration and innovation the use of artificial intelligence has the potential to ameliorate several existing structural efficiencies in the discharge of government functions india being among the fastest growing economies of the world and with the second largest population has a significant stake in the ai revolution it has its own unique set of challenges that it needs to address in terms of access affordability as well as shortage and uh, relative uh, lack of skilled expertise effective implementation of ai initiatives needs scalable solutions for emerging economies endeavors to tackle some of these global challenges from ai's perspective are very important we are aware that ai is an ever evolving era area and the mechanism that needs to be in place goes beyond a single time one shot solutions but to ones which are constantly evolving and which are sustainable and customized so with this background it is my privilege to introduce the session i will be your host for the session in the session we have initially two keynote addresses uh, we have a keynote address by mr henry verdier who is the french ambassador for digital affairs for government of france he is developed the french national open data portal and is also led mfg labs which is an internet startup involved in social data mining he will be talking about transparency accountability and citizen protection since we could not have the present uh, the uh, 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 Mr. Henry Verdier, speaking to us live because of the time constraints, we have done the next best thing and have recorded a session. So may I now request the organizers to please play his keynote address. <laughs> To begin with, I would like to express how pleased I am to speak before you today at the invitation of the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology of India. Thank you, dear Secretary Meiti Sri Ajay Shone. Discussing how we can best utilize AI is a need of our times. The fact that India dedicates a five-day event to it and gathers such a wide and high-level range of stakeholders. It illustrates again that this country is at the forefront of today's and tomorrow's challenges. And this is one of the reasons why France is fully committed to the deepening of its cooperation with India on digital technologies and cybersecurity. We have set our common approach on those key issues in an ambitious and concrete roadmap in 2019 on AI. Both from the research and governance point of view, unsurprisingly, stands at the core of it. In fact, a milestone has been reached this week, with Indian Centre for Development of Advanced Computing and French company Atos announcing that they will jointly build India's fastest AI supercomputer, Param Shidi. I could not agree more with the way Prime Minister Modi. in his opening of phrase laid out both the opportunities in education agriculture healthcare urbanization etc and the challenges of ai the current crisis has indeed highlighted how much digital and new technologies like ai are a valuable tool for our societies and economies which help us to fight the pandemic and will be a key component in the post crisis period but along with benefits and no one should be left behind for what regards those benefits there are also challenges abuse of personal data bias amplification inclusion of the diversity sovereignty we will have to mitigate those to those challenges to ensure trust and this france fully shares india's position expressed by prime minister modi sound algorithm governance is key to establish this trust 
The growing influence of algorithms on our lives reinforces AI's place in the public debate. For example, when we consulted the supporters of the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace earlier this year, artificial intelligence was the technology most cited by participants in terms of both potential destabilizing impact and promising applications. Therefore, we have to increase our cooperation in order to maximize the benefits of AI for our economies and societies and mitigate the risks. The involvement of all stakeholders in this inclusive and ambitious debate, governments, civil society, private sectors, academics and experts, is a prerequisite and will be the main source of innovation. I want to insist on this. And to allow this involvement, transparency, accountability and protection of privacy are key. Many multilateral initiatives, including multi-stakeholder dialogue, have emerged to bring an answer to this question. For example, at the United Nations level, with the Secretary General's Roadmap on Digital Cooperation and the UNESCO's work on, on a legal instrument on the ethic of AI. We are also deeply involved on regional initiatives regarding ethics of AI within the European Union and the Council of Europe. And of course, there is the work of the OECD with its recommendation on AI, which inspired the G20 AI principles. Many other initiatives exist all over the world at a regional level. So, at this stage, I think we can agree that we do not lack institutional mechanisms for collaboration regarding AI. Our contribution on this matter is, of course, the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, GPI, that we have created with India, Canada, and 12 other founding members, Australia, Germany, Italy, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, Singapore, Slovenia, the United Kingdom, the United States of America, and the European Union. Together, we have come to the same conclusions that we have to defend democratic values to better contribute to the global dialogue on AI and to promote a human-centric vision of AI that is respectful of human rights. The OECD recommendation on AI forms the basis of these democratic values. UNESCO, with its expertise on ethics, was also involved in this process and will continue to participate. This initiative will permit an upstream dialogue between the best scientists and experts and public decision makers, which is a key condition for designing effective responses and recommendations necessary to cope with current and future challenges faced by our societies. We have identified four priority topics, responsible AI, data governance, future of work, innovation and commercialization. Moreover, the current crisis has obviously led us to include a focus on how to answer to the current pandemic with an impression from the G7 this year. The JPI will be supported by two centers of expertise in Paris, piloted by INRIA, or National Institute for Research in Digital Sciences and Technology, and Montreal, and a secretariat hosted at the OECD to maximize synergies with this organization. This launch is a tremendous satisfaction for us after two years of very hard work with our Canadian partners since 2018. I hope I didn't say too much because Elisabeth Tomareno, I say hello, the head of the Secretariat, is on the panel and she will develop further. I will then rather focus on why France initiated JPI and how it matches perfectly with the objectives and values France is promoting regarding this technology, the construction of an AI for humanity. First, it highlights that we don't have to be afraid to say that we have values, that these values, human rights, are democratic and universal, and that we have to defend them. Secondly, it sends a signal that our values will shape technology and technical choices, and not the opposite. 
Those messages are really important and must structure our actions because without these values, without ethics, we'll never reach a trustworthy AI. To conclude, I want to highlight the importance of maintaining a constant dialogue and foster cooperation between these initiatives and with the amazing debates within scientific, business and civil society communities. I wish a very good debate to the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Verdier, for reiterating France's commitment uh, to the key focus areas of GPI and also collaboration with India as well as other economies on digital technologies and uh, values, as well as on promoting transparency, accountability, and citizen protection that resonate deeply with our own AI pursuit. You've also rightfully emphasized the potentially destabilizing impact of AI in society in the absence of appropriate uh, and sufficient institutional safeguards. We are privileged to be among the founding members of GPI along with France, and we look forward to furthering the dialogue on key focus areas on responsible AI with you. You brought up the national supercomputing mission and uh, the role that ATOS, which is a global leader in digital transformation, is uh, playing in this regard. So this allows me to welcome our next keynote Dr. Natalia Jimenez Lozano to discuss the work of ETOS in precision medicine. Dr. Lozano, uh, she is the ETOS Director of High Performance Computing, AI, and Quantum Life Sciences at the Center of Excellence, Cambridge, UK. She'll be talking about potential of AI in precision medicine through CompBioMed, which is a quantum learning machine. Uh, Unfortunately, we didn't have the pleasure of uh, listening to Dr. Natalia Jimenez Lozano um, through a live uh, interaction. So we have also recorded her keynote address and I request the organizers to play that. Hello everybody, my name is Natalia Jimenez and I'm the director of the ATOS HPC AI and Quantum Life Sciences Center of Excellence. Uh, ATOS is a global leader in digital transformation with more than 100,000 employees in 73 countries and with an annual revenue of 12 billion euros. Um, I'm delighted to be here today uh, to show you some initiatives of my company for patient care improvement using artificial intelligence. Let's start. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to frame uh, what is the role of ATOS in all this. Uh, by, um, um, the role is to bridge the gap between research and healthcare. Um, so we are uh, facilitating the uh, translation of all the uh, science uh, breakthroughs into uh, the clinical settings. Uh, with the final aim of uh, facilitating the implementation of precision medicine. As you know, precision medicine is based in four pillars, predictive, preventative, personalized, and participatory. And if you have a look to this slide, you have on the left-hand side, the fresh and bone human being, where well, we are doing many procedures or uh, techniques or methodologies in order to get more understanding about the status of health or disease of this patient. Um, as you can imagine, all this data is gathered in different ways, uh, using different formats. The volume of data is massive. So this is big data. And we need to transform all big, this big data into actionable insights. And this is where technologies such as high performance computing, big data analytics, quantum learning machine, cybersecurity, edge computing, Internet of Things, and of course, artificial intelligence um, uh, come into place. Uh, with the idea of transforming this uh, fresh and bone human being into a digital avatar where we can perform as many use cases as we may want. So uh, how are we doing do uh, that? Well, the final aim is uh, this uh, patient empowerment. 
So we are um, uh, studying carefully what are the projects uh, that, uh, that, and what are the different challenges of those projects. So we are matching those challenges with the technologies and we are co-creating solutions uh, together with, uh, with uh, uh, healthcare professionals or researchers in order to try to find the right solution for their uh, patients. Um, so I'm bringing here three main relevant projects and pilots. Uh, ConBiomed is a consortium for the virtual human project. It's a center of excellence in biomedicine uh, basically, what, uh, what we are trying to do in this project is uh, to simulate all the different processes of the human body. Uh, for example, how the heart is pumping blood to tissues and organs or how the DNA replicates. So, and this is different from person to person. So we are trying to highlight what are the uniqueness of, of a people by creating this digital avatar. And obviously, AI plays a very important role here in the prediction of uh, potential anomalous events. If we are able to simulate, we are able to predict. And then uh, here we have a POC, a proof of concept uh, with uh, a quantum, uh, with our quantum learning machine, which is a, a quantum uh, simulator. And here, what we did was uh, to identify uh, comorbidity uh, um, patterns in clinical trials. This is a POC because uh, it was only uh, aimed at um, a, a, a validating this kind of approach. Um, obviously, the, the result was good. Um, and finally, this uh, Atos Codex AI Suite, which is our approach uh, to uh, artificial intelligence, and we are uh, 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 driving this in a research center in Spain. Uh, which is uh, working in the meta-analysis of clinical, omics, and image data. And now I'm bringing some use cases. Uh, this is the uh, one uh, on diabetes uh, and, and how to deploy predictive modeling to better monitor uh, diabetes. Um, or, um, obviously, to identify and engage with patients at risk of developing this disease who could benefit uh, from a preventive care. Here we have two medical doctors. They are discussing about patients uh, prone to suffer diabetes. They get an alert informing that the two new variants uh, have been identified uh, that predispose patients who have it uh, to uh, have a diabetes, uh, diabetes uh, type 2. So uh, they query the database of uh, sequencing, uh, sequence patients. Uh, well, as this is in, uh, ahead in the future, uh, we will have all the uh, uh, patients' uh, sequence uh, in a database, obviously secure and anonymized. So we would be able to query those uh, databases. So as a result of a query, they get uh, 80 patients could, uh, that could, uh, who could be at risk of suffering uh, diabetes. And they check that uh, with electronic medical records to see how many of those patients are really at risk, uh, meaning that they have compatible symptomatology, and then they get uh, the, 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 the list of uh, patients that are uh, potentially at risk of suffering this condition. They can connect with those uh, through mobile applications and those patients can send their glucose uh, measurements uh, through these uh, applications. So this is on diabetes, let's go to cardiovascular diseases. Uh, this is on, well, how to monitor patients that could be at risk of suffering cardiovascular diseases. We know that they are at risk because we do the genetic profile of those individuals. We are able to monitor them through uh, wearable devices, uh, such as this T-shirt, which is able to perform electrocardiograms in real time. So um, this, uh, this data is connected uh, with the, this uh, platform that is secure, anonymized, and this platform uh, has an AI underlying system that is able to identify or to, uh, possible uh, anomalous events to predict anomalous events on those patients. And this is very important and relevant, of course, to the monitoring of these uh, cardiovascular diseases. As you know, uh, this is the leading cause of death in developed countries. Um, then we have a prediction of asthma outbreaks uh, with artificial intelligence. Here we have a patient, asthmatic patient. Uh, well, uh, she's uh, sending uh, her data 
uh, through mobile applications. And uh, in this case, the data is oxygen saturation levels. Uh, this data is sent to a system powered by AI that predicts the likelihood of an asthma outbreaks. Uh, the system is connected uh, to the meteor agencies uh, to know what are the levels of pollutants and also um, of, of uh, pollen uh, so that uh, you can uh, get an idea of, um, of, of the uh, possible outbreaks uh, of, uh, of asthmatic patients. Then, as a result, you get a series of recommendations uh, that are sent uh, to patients through uh, this application. And this uh, recommendation could be, for example, to increase the dose of inhalers or uh, to wear uh, face masks or to avoid certain areas uh, with high levels of pollen. Um, the system is also able to suggest uh, the eligibility to participate in clinical trials or be monitored more closely uh, by the hospital or healthcare system. So now let's go for breast cancer risk prediction. This is, a, a, as I say, risk prediction uh, powered by AI. Uh, you know that there, there, there are existing screening programs that are for women uh, over the age of 45, but for those women uh, under this age, uh, there is nothing in place uh, to be able to predict uh, their likelihood of suffering uh, this devastating disease. So here, what we are proposing is uh, to to, uh, to set up a system uh, that is able to gather information from electronic medical records, mammography, or any kind of imaging data, next generation sequencing or genom genomics data, uh, pathology images, immunostochemistry devices, as well as clinical trials. This, uh, this system should be trained with enough data from healthy um, and, and healthy patients in order to be able to, to train it well uh, um, uh, for, for it to, to be able to, uh, to do the inference of those patients that are more likely to suffer uh, uh, well, sorry, uh, cancer, breast cancer in the future. And obviously this information uh, is used by the medical doctors uh, to uh, choose the, the most uh, suitable treatment options for those patients to avoid the onset of, of, those, uh, of, of this disease. Um, and that's the, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I leave you here with a set of links uh, to videos and case studies in case you are um, um, interested in knowing more about our projects and initiatives. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, have a very good event. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Lozano, for a very succinct description of ATOS's work, which gave us some very good insight on the potential of AI in precision medicine. Uh, health is a focus area of AI-based solutions, and it has been fostering with so much innovation and activity, which has been steering the ecosystem. It is also giving rise to questions about equity in healthcare delivery, as also ethical considerations that have to be addressed by the AI governance framework. Let me also again mention that uh, ATOS is a very valuable partner with the CDEC and with the Ministry of Electronics and IT in development of India's uh, very own national supercomputer mission, which will be a very integral part of our national program on artificial intelligence. So that now, friends, takes me to the panel discussion on AI governance and institutional mechanism for collaboration and innovation. The discussion is going to be moderated by Mr. Jayesh Ranjan, who is the Principal Secretary, Industries and IT uh, Department of Telangana Government. Telangana, as some of you are aware, has been doing some path-breaking initiatives and has taken an early lead in terms of uh, setting up governance models around AI, as also deployment of solutions uh, in their administrative setup, as well as uh, especially uh, addressing some of the citizen uh, concerns about AI. So uh, who is, uh, that is the reason why, in fact, uh, I, we requested Mr. Jay Shanyanji, who is, who is a feature now in this um, over the last five days. And uh, the work of Telangana has been talked about a lot uh, in different sessions. So without further ado, now may I request uh, 
Mr. So Jay Shanjan, to take up the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Saurabh. Welcome to all the panelists, all the participants, members of the audience. As introduced, my name is Jayesh Ranjan. I work for the provincial government of Telangana, with Hyderabad being our capital city. And uh, as a state, uh, we are very upbeat about uh, the virtues, the values of artificial intelligence. Incidentally, the year of 2020 is being commemorated in the state of Telangana as the year of AI. And uh, in the process of commemorating this year as the year of AI, we have come out with a very elaborate uh, framework on AI, which also speaks about uh, multiple responsibilities which AI developers, AI promoters, AI users uh, need to follow. Some of the important AI ethical concerns related to accountability, transparency, avoiding biases, ensuring privacy, and of course, uh, security and safety. And uh, the other important feature about uh, Telangana's approach towards AI is that we have always believed in collaboration. At no time do we feel that the government is the repository of all knowledge, all wisdom. We feel that there are multiple partner organizations in the academia, in the private sector, amongst think tanks, amongst uh, startups, who all have a lot to contribute and put on the table when we need to roll out uh, AI-enabled solutions. So, uh, as I said, there is a rich uh, understanding about uh, the responsibilities behind uh, AI governance and, of course, the opportunities to collaborate for fostering newer uh, AI products and solutions. I am delighted that we have uh, five very eminent panelists to discuss, share their experiences, offer new perspectives on these two very important uh, themes. As uh, the moderator explained, there are two parts to the theme. We are going to speak about AI governance and we are also going to speak about institutional mechanism for collaboration and innovation. So, of course, while uh, all the five panelists are eminently uh, competent to speak on both of these top teams, but to begin with, I'll be asking uh, a specific question to a particular panelist. So the format is like this. Before I introduce the five panelists, I'll be asking an opening question to each of you, one after the other. And as I said, the question will either touch on the governance issue or on the collaboration and uh, uh, mechanism for uh, institutionalizing that collaboration, etc. But after each of you speak, uh, let us say for five minutes or so uh, to respond to the opening question, then I will give a 10 to 15 minutes uh, window where anyone can respond to any question or any answer which any of the panelists gave. If the answer struck a thought in you, please feel free to express it. And even if some question was not asked to you, but if you feel that you have something special to bring on the table, please feel free to do that. And after this 15 minutes of interlude, I'll move on to the second question and perhaps we will uh, run out of time with that. So we intend to uh, continue this uh, discussion roughly for about uh, 45 minutes or so. So please be very mindful of time. I would request each of you when you are uh, making uh, your uh, responses to the opening question, please uh, take no more than uh, four to five minutes. And if you are going beyond five minutes, I'll have the unpleasant duty of kind of butting in and reminding you to wrap up. So uh, let me very quickly introduce the panelists. Our uh, first panelist is Mr. Ajay Sahni, who is the secretary of the Ministry for Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India, one of the key pillars of uh, India's uh, growth story. In the, in the IT world. And I feel very proud to share with you, all of you that the position which I occupy now in Telangana was occupied many years ago by Mr. Sahni. So I'm his uh, grand, grand, grand successor, but very big shoes to fill. Nevertheless, very happy to have him on the panel. The next uh, uh, distinguished panelist is uh, Ms. Uh, Elizabeth Thomas uh, Reno, who heads the GPAI Secretariat in uh, OECD. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth, if you can also turn on, on video so that we all know that you are here and you are responding to us. Uh, GPAI, as many of you would know, is the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence. It uh, brings together experts from the scientific community, industry, civil society, governments and international organizations to foster international collaboration and uh, cooperation on applied uh, AI issues. And uh, Elizabeth and her role supports the governing bodies on, uh, of the GPAI 
and uh, liaises with uh, multiple wings uh, within the OECD. Before the current role, she was also the head of uh, digital economic policy at the International uh, Chamber of Commerce. So welcome, Elizabeth. We still can't see you. Oh, yeah, th there you are. So welcome and greetings to you. The third distinguished uh, panelist today is uh, Mr. Shamik uh, Kundu, who is the chief uh, data officer at uh, Standard Chartered Bank, uh, currently located in uh, Singapore. While he has a very important role uh, in the technology uh, interplay in his bank, but he has played uh, some very critical assignments in uh, fostering responsible AI and AI governance in his other uh, capacities. So he was, he is, for example, the co-author of the Monetary Authority of Singapore's guidelines on responsible AI. Similarly, he was associated with Bank of England's uh, AI's public partnership uh, model for uh, governance. And he's also a member, uh, coincidentally, of the GPAI. So uh, welcome, Mr. Kundu. The next uh, eminent uh, panelist is uh, Ms. Eleonora Harwich, who works for a London-based uh, think tank called uh, Reform UK. Uh, she has a very strong uh, interest and focus on uh, tech innovation in the public sector, especially healthcare. And uh, she has been associated with multiple uh, institutions, multiple uh, bodies in England, uh, regulatory bodies, etc., to set up uh, AI standards. And uh, we hope to hear from her about a global perspective, particularly the UK perspective on uh, AI governance. And also, I'll ask her to speak about uh, healthcare mm -hmm. and some of the important uh, governance issues on healthcare as well. The final uh, panelist is uh, Ms. Audrey Plonk, who also incidentally represents the OECD. She's the head of the Digital Economy uh, Policy Division and uh, in some ways uh, also helps perhaps uh, Elizabeth in uh, GPAI in pushing forward the digital governance uh, agenda. She also has a very rich uh, industry experience. She worked for Intel for about 10 years on uh, digital policy issues. So someone who has seen uh, both the industry phase as well as the public governance phase of uh, this issue. And uh, obviously some of my questions to her will be on, on which side has uh, what kind of priorities and what kind of interest, etc. So uh, welcome uh, all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and let me straight away begin by asking Mr. Sani, but uh, also uh, a quick reminder that please do keep uh, the time barriers in mind. Please start uh, winding up your answers uh, by the fourth minute and uh, definitely by four and a half to five minutes, you must uh, yield the floor to the next uh, speaker. So uh, question to uh, Mr. Ajay Sani, sir. Sir, the national government, your ministry in particularly METI has been doing considerably policy work on data governance in the last few years. In fact, the personal data protection bill is now on the verge of becoming an act and we are all uh, very eagerly looking forward to it. We have also initiated action on the draft uh, data governance framework for non-personal data. And uh, I'm sure with your experience, you are aware of the tensions between the industry, the free market proponents and the regulators. So what do you think are the key principles which are required for a robust uh, data governance policy for AI? which maintains a healthy balance between the open market uh, innovation and uh, people who do not want uh, innovation to be stifled, but at the same time, the larger public interests, uh, which in some ways the government is responsible to uphold and also regulators, et cetera. So can you tell a little bit about how does one strike that balance and what is your personal experience since you steered two very important pieces of uh, legislation? How have you been able to strike that uh, balance? Uh, thank you, Jayesh. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to be a part of this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Uh, the government, uh, I think, has uh, a responsibility on several fronts. On one side, uh, the government has the responsibility to create an ecosystem that fosters innovation, that encourages uh, uh, startups that uh, uh, you know nurtures uh, companies uh, that enables business to happen uh, uh, in a healthy manner and to grow uh, rapidly and also uh, it has the responsibility to uh, create an ecosystem which is fair and uh, reasonable and 
uh, you know, it uh, it uh, uh, provides uh, trust and confidence uh, to the uh, to the users, to the citizens, uh, that it's a, a just framework and uh, uh, that uh, their uh, data would not uh, be misused or uh, their protection of uh, their uh, data privacy would be uh, built into the uh, into the ecosystem. Uh, so in balancing these, uh, I think there have been initiatives across the globe and uh, learning from some of the best among them um, and building on top of that, uh, adapting them to Indian uh, requirements. Uh, we have come out with the personal data protection bill uh, that is now before the parliament. Uh, a, a committee, joint committee of both houses of the parliament uh, was set up to scrutinize uh, uh, this bill. Uh, that committee has also done uh, extensive consultations and we expect that uh, once that committee uh, submits its uh, report to the parliament again, uh, this bill will be taken up uh, uh, by the parliament and we uh, hope that uh, by uh, uh, early next year we will have uh, uh, the legislation uh, uh, in place. Uh, so this will actually uh, lay down uh, the key principles of uh, how uh, personally identifiable data is uh, to be dealt with, uh, what are the uh, safeguards, uh, how do we ensure that uh, uh, consent is taken, how do we ensure that uh, it is handled in a responsible manner at all levels uh, by whoever might be the uh, data fiduciary. Uh, in this bill, we have actually, uh, you know, used the term fiduciary instead of uh, data controller, uh, because we believe that uh, in, large entities that handle uh, uh, data, uh, people's personal data, have a fiduciary responsibility. That data is uh, given to them in trust, and they must, uh, you know, continue to maintain that trust. So many of the principles that are laid down in that uh, uh, legislation uh, are reflective of this uh, philosophy. Uh, we have also set up a committee uh, uh, headed by a very uh, eminent uh, uh, and distinguished uh, uh, person from the industry, leader from the industry, uh, Mr. Chris Kopalakrishnan. Uh, this is a, a multi-stakeholder kind of a, a committee and that has come up with the framework on uh, non-personal data. And this again, uh, we have uh, had a look at uh, uh, you know, what is going on across the globe in Europe, in other locations. And uh, a draft was shared uh, for public consultations. A large number of responses have come to that committee. That committee will now firm up its report and uh, give its report to us. And that will uh, help us uh, create our own uh, uh, framework. There are uh, uh, two other uh, things that I would like to mention. Uh, one that we are uh, moving forward very aggressively with the a strategy of creating a nationwide India scale uh, public digital platforms. So these platforms are in place in, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the form of uh, the um, uh, national ID, Aadhaar, uh, another ecosystem that is uh, in the area of finance in which uh, UPI is one of the prominent and visible, uh, you know, platforms. Uh, a third system uh, for taxation, which has unified taxation across uh, uh, India uh, in the shape of GST, and, and a fourth one uh, in the form of uh, a GEM platform for government uh, procurement. And we are moving forward with similar platforms in health, in education, in agriculture, in logistics, in criminal justice system, in jobs and skills, and many more. So with these come, um, you know, regulatory sandboxes and uh, test beds, which will actually create uh, structured opportunities for uh, startups and for uh, companies, uh, uh, big and small, uh, to actually create new solutions, which can be on top of the India health stack or India education stack or India uh, logistics uh, stack. So that way create structured opportunities a national program on AI, which focuses on R&D as well as applied AI, as well as the infrastructure required, will go hand in hand. So these are the elements that we believe will build a very robust and very, uh, you know, tremendous enabling infrastructure, uh, which uh, helps us to, uh, you know, 
realize the vision of uh, uh, having India as the AI garage for the world. So these are the factors that I, we are moving forward with and happy to respond to any more questions later. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, sir. Actually, uh, in some ways, uh, you have given a very good uh, overview about how the balance is being struck in the country. And uh, of course, uh, this announcement that you are going to set up a public digital platform is something very exciting. And uh, incidentally, I was uh, planning to ask something very similar to uh, Mr. Kundu also. So uh, let me straight away, though he was uh, later on in my sequence, but let me ask this question. Let me pull him uh, above, give him a priority sure. and uh, ask this question. So uh, Shamik, the point which uh, Union Secretary Mr. Sani mentioned about these uh, reliable technology platforms. Now, how can we see these as uh, marketplaces for uh, monetization of public and private data and AI services? I mean, obviously, if you are opening them up for startups or even uh, large corporations, there will be an element of uh, monetization. So what would be the right principle of data governance for such a marketplace? And since you are uh, integrally involved in lots of Singapore initiatives, bring some Singapore examples as well, how they monetize public data or uh, AI for AI-based uh, research, innovation, et cetera. Th thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. So I would probably say two different things. I think um, if you look at monetization, uh, to be honest, uh, um, um, Mr. Jesh, I don't think that should be the driver at all, even though I am from the commercial sector. I think the right approach, and of course, with the India financial stack, I was just reading up, Mr. Sani, because I was reading up on OCE and because I knew I might get a question in a minute. But I think I, I've already been uh, close to OCE and, and CRED and all of that stuff, which is on the India stack. I think, to be very honest, Mr. Jesh, we should start with our customer requirements. And I don't mean just our existing customers, but the people we can't reach. So for example, in India, as you know, as a bank for us, we're not very big in India. We've been there for 150 plus years, but we're not that big. But actually, if we can use the stack to help with the expanding our SME footprint, for example, or en enable more global commerce, which is what our core proposition is, I think that should be the driver. I, I mean, direct data monetization, as in this data set is of value for someone to buy. In its own right, I'm not sure I would even want to promote that. And certainly Singapore hasn't gone that down that route, which is almost like selling data. I think what Singapore has done, which is, I think it's also come up in their parliament just now, actually last week, is they have changed the concept from open banking to actually talking about data portability more broadly. And they've done, done two two things. One is data portability across industries, so not limiting to financial services. The second thing they've done is they've talked about business rights to data, uh, which I think, Mr. Sani, would be quite an interesting way of looking at it, which is to say, if you are a fiduciary and you are doing things to keep the data safe, etc., what rights do you have, which are never going to be as primary as the data subjects, but what rights do you have on that data to experiment, to share um, with, uh, for other pieces, et cetera. Now, it will never be as strong as the data subjects, right? But how do you do that? So th that's what Singapore is doing. And maybe Sanghao might talk about that later. Uh, I know he's representing. But that's quite an interesting piece. Uh, one other thing I would like to say, Mr. Son, is I haven't come across another equivalent of, of Mr. Krish Gopal Krishnan's um, non-personal data stuff, because I have been tracking this across the world. And even in GPA, I was just recently mentioning that I think that is truly world leading. I think lots of people have personal data regimes, but the non-personal piece is, is quite interesting. So you take the non-personal data piece there and you take some of the portability and um, business rights, business innovation rights, it's called. So you have personal data rights, but you also have the rights of a business that is taking care of the data to use that data for innovation. I think that is the right approach to take, um, Mr. Jayesh, rather than like purely monetizing for its own sake. I mean, certainly we as an organization have not been pushing that. That monetization must come through, whether it's financial inclusion or promoting trade or something that we already do or something that is a business purpose in itself rather than just selling data. That, that's where we at least stand. Yes, uh, that's, that's a very fair perspective, uh, Mr. Kundu. I'll uh, move now to... Eleonora, Eleonora uh, since you uh, have done lots of work on uh, healthcare, one of the key concerns that we 
are confronted with regularly on AI is about the levels of trust. There is a belief that uh, algorithms can be twisted and uh, there can be an element of manipulation and uh, some of the underlying thoughts which Mr. Kundu spoke about, what are the pitfalls of monetization, all that can also pervade into AI-based solutions, etc. Healthcare is one area where this element of uh, lack of trust or trust deficit is very, very high. So based on your experience in uh, working with the national health systems, etc., how can we build trust in the medical fraternity amongst the public or health officials to uh, work with AI algorithms or to accept algorithm, AI, AI algorithms? In fact, uh, the national government here in India has also announced a massive uh, digital health mission. And uh, they also want to ensure that uh, there is a health stack and every citizen is given a health identity, et cetera, et cetera. So in the healthcare sector, what do you think are the key concerns in terms of ethics, privacy, trust, confidence, and how does one create a robust governance model around that? <laughs> Thanks. So thank you very much for having me. And I think that's a, that's a, it's a massive question to which I think many countries are still struggling with. So I, I am not proposing that, that I'm gonna give you like the kind of million dollar solution to, to all of this, but just um, potentially some reflections on where the landscape is um, in the UK. Um, and I guess some of the reflections off the back of some research um, that I've done. And I will also potentially challenge a bit the point that you uh, just made uh, Samek about the monetization around um, data. So I guess, the question of trust um, and trustworthiness of a lot of these technologies is, is a massive question. And I think it's, it's, it's twofold, right? So you have the question of trust in terms of, you know, does the patient trust these technologies to work when it is patient facing technology? Um, but then you also have the question of trust of do practitioners trust these algorithms and these predictions? Is it explained in a way that, that, you know, creates that type of trustworthiness and those, types of trust actually necessitate different types of transparency just because of the, I guess, knowledge base and skills that these individuals will have facing um, these type of technologies. So the type of, I guess, level of explanation that you might need to provide, say, to a doctor to say, well, you know, this machine learning algorithm arrived to this prediction, this is the sensitivity of, of the result, this is like the accuracy of the test, and so on, you might need a kind of more scientific type of presentation of that information when uh, looking at um, medical professionals. However, obviously, you know, is, is it something that most patients will care about? Potentially not what they really want to know and potentially have clarity about is, you know, does this comply with regulation? Is this safe? And that's basically it. Um, and so obviously, I guess the kind of difficulties within this space is that in terms of regulation, healthcare obviously is a very, very heavily regulated area and rightfully so. I think one of the challenges that these new types of technology are forcing on the regulatory space is obviously, I guess, the typical thing that a lot of people say, regulation does sometimes uh, lag a bit behind the pace of innovation, which is kind of normal. Um, but to be quite honest, in the medical field, you can apply a lot of the rules and the logics that already exist around regulating existing type of technologies to artificial intelligence, bar certain things where we still, you know, are quite uncertain about how to go about it. So say, for example, what is known as live algorithms that continuously learn and change their outputs as more data is kind of fed in. That is obviously something where the frameworks right now, they do exist, they're just not harmonized. Um, so, you know, you have a lot, a lot of working groups at international level that are working on AI standards. Uh, and so there are, there are some standards. It's just that it, at least in the UK, in the regulatory framework, it's still not completely harmonized as to how do you go about validating it? How often? All of those, those type of things. Um, I think the key thing really in terms of regulation to instill trust, I think is very simple kind of clear signs of kite marking. So obviously, the UK, uh, when it was, I guess, still had history with uh, the EU and, st and still obviously right now, uh, one of the very clear markers is what is called a CE mark. So if you go through the regulatory process for a medical device and the device is deemed that it is working appropriately and safe, it gets this clear quality stamp that is called CE mark. 
Um, and that is a clear indicator, both for the consumer and the medical professional, that it has gone through all of the regulatory requirements. Uh, the UK now departing from uh, the EU is going to have its own quality stamp for its own market, which is going to be called the UKCA. And I think that's a kind of clear, clear marker of quality, which can, I guess, give a lot of trust. I think there's also potentially something else in trust, which I think is quite important to think about, is the way that these technologies are designed and the type of interface and the way that you present information about it. So it's not only, you know, the fact that, okay, this is safe to use. Is it easy? Does the presentation of the interface actually, um, I guess, instill trust? Does it look like something that, you know, seems to work, that seems to be providing information in the right way? And I think that's particularly important uh, for medical professionals when what you're trying to do is really to kind of design technologies to help them out in you know, their kind of day-to-day -day job. And one of the pitfalls I think of technology, particularly in the past, is to potentially not have had a good enough appreciation of user-centered design and having designed ultimately systems that are quite clunky. Um, and that is something you know, that is, is, is quite a popular complaint amongst uh, healthcare practitioners is to, you know, to complain about the design of, say, electronic health records or simple things like that. They're actually quite clunky technologies that do, how can I say this, add an extra burden of admin and clunkiness of how to log into all of these systems and all of those things, which ultimately creates a lot of frustration and potentially some certain barriers to adoption because it's not easy, because it's not as snazzy as an app on an iPhone, or it's not as easy as those type of things. And I think it's, it's important to take that into account because I think that definitely poor user-centered design or poor understanding of the need of the user is, is obviously a kind of barrier to, to trust and adoption. Um, another kind of reflection I think is you need to think about the process of AI adoption. I think really in, in sort of stages, right? So you wouldn't, um, you know, when you think about say for example, the way that Amazon developed it, its business, you know, people didn't start buying, I guess, high risk items and by that, I mean expensive ones. So say you didn't start buying washing machines on Amazon when Amazon started. It started gradually, right? So you bought books, which ultimately, if you don't receive it, not the end of the world, you might not complain too much. And then gradually people became slightly more comfortable with the technology and were happy to take kind of bigger levels of risk. So spend bigger sums on, on the site. And I think there's a question of temporality as well in, in digital health, which is, do you start with the easy lower hanging fruit to get adoption? So say, for example, I don't know, automating um, the, I don't know, the, the kind of roster of, of operating theaters in a hospital. You know, it's, it's the type of thing that actually saves a lot of time, can allow you to optimize resources, not a massive risk in the sense that, you know, you're not detecting cancer. Um, and that can actually lead to quite a lot of improvement. People feel comfortable with the technology and then, you know, as, as you kind of move the dial a bit and people get used to it, you might go for, you know, kind of more um, high end cutting edge technologies that, that help to solve different things. And the last point that I wanted to make, uh, which was to challenge a bit what the previous uh, speaker spoke about, is that um, Actually, the, the question around data monetization, obviously, politically speaking, I'm, I'm going to say it's definitely not a, a palatable thing. Uh, no government is going to say, of course, we're going to sell citizen data and, and so on. Um, however, I guess my challenge would be that I, I do think, particularly when you're talking about artificial intelligence, and I think specifically in the applications in the public sector, where ultimately the burden of data collection is on the taxpayer, the maintenance of these systems is on the taxpayer. And because of the way that these technologies work, which is ultimately, you know, creating an algorithm, pretty low value, having the data in itself, pretty low value. It's the combination of the two, particularly when talking about machine learning algorithms, because ultimately it's when you combine the two that you get the right weights, you get all of the right precision, and that's what creates the value, right? And I do think that there is an interesting conversation to be had, and this is not to say that you will value data sets and just sell them, but I do think that there is a, an interesting conversation to be had about what is the right apportioning of value 
of the value of that innovation that you're creating, because ultimately the citizen is putting in something, commercial sector is putting in something. And I think there might need to be a slightly more balanced conversation around that, um, because I think it's definitely possible to, you know, imagine a system whereby you would have, you know, I, I mean, I'm not sure that private sector would be happy of, a, of an intellectual property sharing agreement, but you could, you know, think of revenue sharing agreements, you could think of royalties being paid, and those are things that are part of the discussion in, in, in healthcare um, in the UK, and that there are, you know, conversations around, you know, what's the appropriate type of commercial model. And I will stop there. And Jesh, can I just do a 15 second response, literally just 15 uh, seconds. Yeah. No, no, you, uh, you can't tell me, but I'm yeah. in any case planning to give a 10 minutes window where you. Ah, okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep yeah. that till then. Yeah. That's fine. I, you'll get a 10 minutes window, all of you to respond to each other. But thanks, Ellie. I'll come back to you on uh, life sciences uh, once again. I turn now to Miss Elizabeth. Uh, <clears throat> see, Miss Elizabeth, we are all uh, living in times during which these uh, multilateral organizations are getting uh, more and more discredited. I don't want to name these institutions, but we all know which institutions I'm alluding to. And you now represent a multilateral forum which wants to promote more uh, cooperation, more collaboration in uh, AI research and, uh, and uh, innovation. So uh, what has prompted uh, the creation of uh, GPAI? Can you let us know some of the background behind it and how do you want to take your agenda forward and how really multilateral and completely non-partisan and uh, how objective and fair will it be? How, how do you plan to uh, take up uh, this very important responsibility through the GPAI? Thank you very much um, and, and hello. Uh, I'm very pleased to be participating from here from Paris. Um, I think in order to make sure everybody understands what we're speaking about, GPA is so new, I'd like to introduce it a little bit to you, describe um, who's involved in, and how it's set up in order to answer this question. Um, GPA is the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence. Its founding members have come together to pursue both values-based and expertise-informed responsible AI. It was just launched in June, 2020, so GPA is a voluntary multi-stakeholder initiative. It's meant to foster global cooperation and collaboration. Um, and it, the, the governments that have come together have come together with a shared ambition to bring together experts from industry, civil society, academia, governments, uh, trade unions, all to bridge this gap between theory and practice on AI. So their focus will be on cutting edge research and applied activities, which is different from some of the other international um, activities that you'll hear about, I think today. Um, India is one of the 15 founders. And, and so as a result, GPA's membership is covering 2.5 billion of the world's population. It's brand new, but it has ambitions to grow very inclusively, bringing on board at a reasonable pace more geographic diversity and developing countries that share its founding principles. I mentioned that it's a values-based initiative and so its foundation is on a set of AI principles. They're the ones that were set out by the OECD recommendations on AI and I think you'll hear uh, more about that um, today so I won't go into it but they're also the same principles that are used within the G20. So there's a lot of um, uh, so are already a good collaborative start uh, behind the impetus of, of uh, GPA. It was initiated by the Canadian and the French presidencies of the G7, and they came up with an innovative approach, I think, something, uh, something new. GPA is a community. Um, it has a governing council of all its members that will oversee the direction and it will evolve uh, the initiative. They will set the... Um, they'll have ultimate responsibility, but there's a steering committee that will implement that direction. And that steering committee is multi-stakeholder. It has five elected governments, representatives, and six non-governmental representatives from the communities that I mentioned before. Our job at the GPA Secretariat, hosted kindly out of the OECD, but independent of it, is to convene and facilitate the work of these bodies and to liaise with the GPA community. So there are two centers of expertise. There's one in Montreal and one in Paris. 
And these are the bodies that will be administering and supporting the working groups. Um, uh, the experts that are collaborating in these working groups are have started work on four key themes, responsible AI, under which is a subgroup uh, uh, in AI and pandemics. There's a group working group on data governance, future of work, and innovation and commercialization. The member countries nominated these experts. So they had the opportunity to nominate at least two leading, up to two leading experts for each of the four working groups. So there are experts contributing from India in each of these groups. The GPA community will invite additional experts at, in December when we have what's called our multi-stakeholder experts group plenary. And this is an opportunity for the working groups that have uh, prepared the outputs each year to bring them forward to the member governments, to the, uh, their peers in the community, and also outside experts to evaluate, to challenge, to question, and to help set the agenda for the next year. So again, I, I think these are, are some of the innovations that have come into the, um, to the model of GPAY. Uh, in addition to those members of the working groups that are um, appointed uh, uh, by governments, there are observers, important uh, observers. There's permanent observers from the relevant divisions of the OECD. So they're making sure that they're contributing work that's being done elsewhere and avoiding duplication. There are also representatives from UNESCO participating in these observer, as observers in these working groups, which again helps to um, ensure that there is a link to different activities and, and um, that the experts are informed by other global um, cooperation. Just very briefly to give you one example of uh, what will come out of these working groups, the subgroup on AI and pandemics has uh, been focused on what I think we can agree is a very practical and immediately useful um, cataloging of tools and applications in AI. So their output in December will present um, this uh, ca catalog where um, it evaluates uh, AI for accelerating research, AI for early detection and diagnosis, AI for prediction surveillance and AI for response to the crisis, as well as AI for recovery. So we are just ahead of our very first plenary, which will take place in December in its early days. But I think there's something very um, encouraging and exciting about the collaboration that's going on in these groups. Member countries have already noted that the benefit for them is in sharing this global understanding of AI related priorities across science, innovation, and governance, but also having this access to globally leading expertise and project-based initiatives that will facilitate progress uh, for global AI capacity, readiness, and capability. So I think uh, we, it, it will stand the test uh, um, coming up as uh, the experts gather and uh, have this exchange, but. Um, I, I'm really uh, looking forward to, to what's to come and I'm grateful we actually have some of our expert members on the panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Very informative and glad that your uh, initial set of uh, themes that you have chosen are uh, very, very topical. They relate to the current uh, crisis that all of us are faced with. I'll come back to you on certain other themes a little later, but turning over to uh, Audrey now, you are also a part of OECD, but as I mentioned earlier when I was introducing you, you have worked with the private sector as well. So my question uh, relates to collaboration, coordination, but I would like you to look at your Intel days as well and uh, look at your current responsibilities now. How does one really bring the private and the public together, ensuring that uh, they are wholeheartedly into that partnership? There is no kind of one-upmanship, everyone expects the other uh, to be, I mean, how does one create a win-win situation to bring the best of uh, partners into a partnership. And uh, once you complete this, then do tell us a little bit more about the work that you are doing in uh, OECD and uh, how does it relate to the GPA that uh, Elizabeth spoke about. Uh, thank you so much and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you around the world. Thank you for including the OECD in the discussion today. It's a very important topic. 
Um, I think it's uh, it, it's it, the question of partnerships and how to bring people to the table um, without the one-upmanship or too many conflicting interests is a good one. Um, and indeed, my 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 long time in in the private sector in Silicon Valley may uh, I may have some some useful insight there. One thing I will say about the topic of artificial intelligence is that unlike other topics I've seen that can be a bit more divisive, AI, I think um, because it is so general purpose following um, <clears throat> Ambassador Verdier's comments this morning, and it, it is so promising, I've seen an, an immense amount of collaboration around the world on, on this topic. Um, and I think it reflects uh, a, a strong desire on the part of both industry, civil society, government and academia to be as forward leaning as possible to enable this technology to transform people's lives for the better and our societies for the better. And um, I think with that spirit, I, I've seen a lot of, of collaboration. I'll give you one example, which is perhaps a um, a segue back to the work of the OECD, which I'll, I'll talk about it at more length after I answer your first question. Uh, but if you look at the uh, OECD's uh, network of experts on artificial intelligence, what we call 1AI, we have a vast uh, set of people uh, involved from all walks of the world, all different countries, technical expertise, policy expertise, social scientists, academics, um, really coming together, industry, people building products, actually having to, uh, to, to turn out a profit and make something work, um, coming to the table to talk about how do we make broadly agreed upon responsible, trustworthy principles into something more actionable. I think one challenge from the private sector's perspective, I would imagine, and just again, speaking from my previous experiences, is to take things that are generic policy statements or generic principles and translate them into something that is that people are going to use, that people are going to implement, that 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 a, that an engineer sitting somewhere in in maybe Bangalore or uh, Shenzhen or um, or California is going to actually uh, be able to do something with. And so I think that's our big challenge in, in a lot of ways as the global community as to how. We've, we've, we've coalesced around these principles and um, the OECD was at the forefront of, of developing them and getting them accepted both at the OECD, but then more broadly, um, the G20 principles reflect the OECD principles. The OECD principles are the foundation of the GPAY. And so at a very, in a, in a, in a, in a very fundamental way, there are these things that we all agree on. And so the next step is how do we bring all of those stakeholders to the table to take them from the theory, uh, which is extremely important. We have to agree at, at the theoretical level to the practical level and the practitioner level. And I think that's where um, I'm very encouraged because of the amount of, uh, of, of interaction I've seen just in my role pr prior to the OECD, but coming back to the OECD, but also as other, other speakers mentioned, um, the significant number of activities going on around the world, organizations bringing stakeholders together to look specifically at different aspects of this. So um, as Ms. Harwich said about the, the, a lot about the health sector and what's happening there, as Mr. Kundu said about the uh, finance sector. So you see an immense amount of investment um, because I actually think people really care about getting this as close to a, a binary sense of, of correct as we can at, at the outset. Um, but I also think, you know, at the theoretical level, we have to show value for the practical level to come engage at the theoretical and at the policy level. Um, and so that means we also have to get out of um, at the hypothetical and a, a bit more into the real. And I think that's exactly, as I said, what we're trying to do with the OECD's uh, 1AI group. It's also, I think, what the intent of GPA is, and I can talk about that a little bit more. Um, and, and so we're very fortunate at the OECD to be hosting the GPA. Um, the role, our role there is to host the secretariat and to help shepherd along uh, the growth and the development of that organization uh, in concert with the work that the OECD is already doing within its, its membership. And, and so when I look at their, their, the constitution of the working groups and the topics that they're taking on and the incredible amount of expertise 
they've brought together. It's really unparalleled um, and complementary uh, in so many ways to other policy work being done across the world, including at the OECD. So I hope that that gave a little bit of, of your of, of the response uh, to your first question. And let me just see if you'd like to go to the second one about uh, GPAY specifically and or the OECD. Uh, Audrey, I think we'll uh, move to that question in the second part. But uh, okay. Now, now as I as I had promised, a short window is available for uh, all the panelists if they want to take any other question also, even if it was not addressed to them or if they want to comment on anything which any other panelists mentioned. So we'll spend uh, maybe five to seven minutes uh, doing that. So I'll begin with you, uh, Mr. Kundu, please. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I was just going to say two things. First of all, um, actually three things. First, um, Eleanor, uh, I think there's a difference between starting with monetization as an objective and saying, I want to start with innovation and, and kind of uh, commercialization more broadly, and then saying the benefits from that must accrue a bit in an extreme situation. It's like every individual's data, if it's used, just like you get a small share from your YouTube video share, if it's viewed, you should be able to get a share. But my point was the starting point should not be monetization. The starting point can be innovation, can be competition, it can be many other things. But yes, once you use it, you should look at how we can uh, you know, feedback. So that was one point. I think back to um, just just one other thing on 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 the or actually a couple of other things, uh, Mr. Sony. In terms of India's contribution to the GPA piece, I genuinely think the the non personal data piece is very unique, and I think uh, we should see how that can help potentially be a basis more broadly. I'll certainly push it in myself in the in the working group together with quite the complementary piece that Singapore has on portability and business innovation rights. And lastly, just to bring the point on, um, on how this collaboration works. I mean, my role in the data working group, I feel completely embarrassed because everybody around me has multiple PhDs and has been doing research forever. The only thing is they have been mostly doing PhDs and, and lots of research. So when they come up with, hey, this is what we want to do, my role is to say, ah, it'll take me two years to try and understand that, never mind implement it. So I think there is a very critical role for private sector to play, uh, which is to understand whether what is coming is implementable. There is another complementary role for private sector to play, which is, for example, the CEO of Data Robot, which is a major AI enabler. He's on this group personally, and his role is to see how technology can help with some of these um, you know, principles that we are bringing about. So I think there is a huge amount of value to have private sector. And there's also a huge amount of value in having this cross geography collaboration. Uh, so that's, that's what I want to say. Mr. Sani, please. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Shamik, uh, thank you for your suggestions on the uh, non-personal data framework uh, that is coming up uh, in India and how it could be relevant, uh, you know, while uh, uh, taking up, uh, you know, discussions uh, further at the global level as well, uh, in in uh, conjunction with some of the ideas that are coming in from Singapore, uh, we'll pursue that. The one point I wanted to mention, which uh, I think we uh, uh, these are actually sort of elephant in the room, or rather elephants in the room that we don't uh, talk about. So. I think the what makes uh, many people uncomfortable uh, about the uh, you know emerging uh, uh, technologies is the winner take all character of uh, of uh, you know what what the technology platforms uh, end up becoming in any uh, domain of activity you end up with the uh, one exceptionally dominant uh, platform maybe two from some other part of the geography and uh, you know another two or three which count and the remaining ones is a long tail so how to sort of uh, you know uh, and these are uh, global platforms and these are massive platforms so uh, you know till we get it right uh, uh, as to uh, you know how to deal with the global platforms in the context of a national or regional uh, uh, strategies I think it will be very difficult to actually uh, deal with uh, uh, with AI. AI is just adding on to this uh, uh, current uh, uh, enormous uh, ecosystem, and uh, I think without doing enough about uh, about that part, 
it will be very difficult to get it right uh, in ai so uh, i think those concerns do need uh, to uh, to actually be discussed and get reflected uh, whenever we have a meaningful discussion because uh, and uh, i would uh, you know also um, the 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 <coughs> initiatives that i mentioned about the nationwide uh, uh, public digital platforms uh, is one way Uh, that nation states uh, could actually uh, you know deal with uh, with some of this uh, uh, you know uh, with some of these issues uh, because in organizing uh, uh, you know things in a domain at the nationwide level uh, we actually uh, bring structure to it we actually make sure that uh, opportunities are created but they are created in a responsible manner so uh, the entities that actually uh, you know build on uh, uh, data assets uh, actually do that in a responsible manner and in a fair just and equitable manner so i think these are uh, aspects which uh, i would uh, personally want uh, a lot more uh, discussion on and a lot more attention being paid to these because as long as we keep uh, brushing these under the carpet we are not going to get the best uh, best ecosystem in place which satisfies everyone thank you thank you sir uh, <clears throat> ellie go ahead yeah sorry i just just bouncing back on that point i i do i do genuinely think that the the whole conversation around ultimately the the kind of market structure that you're creating and you know are you allowing for the right level of competition is is a really really important one and a very pervasive one when when you're talking about um AI and just a kind of very quick reflection on on some of the things that we've been seeing uh developing in the UK so so but my point is that in sometimes some areas you might have very natural monopolies that develop so say for example if you're looking at i don't know creating a platform that would integrate a lot of data um so say for example in healthcare so this recently happened in a in a public private partnership uh, that the NHS had with a private sector company and that private sector company obviously integrated all of that data to create a dashboard to basically kind of visualize rates of infection and and so on in in the UK. So in a way I can completely understand, you know, why you might not want to have 10,000 companies doing data integration at least at a national level because why would you want to link data 10,000 times in the same data in the same way. So I can completely understand the natural monopoly there, but I guess in the same way that you have regulation say around you know the kind of telecoms infrastructure of saying well you know you might not have 10 million companies building the actual infrastructure but you might might have allow competition around provision there are ways i think in which you can kind of translate similar principles to what is happening in the kind of ai sector so in the same way that you know maybe some infrastructural stuff you might let a kind of one single company do some things but you might want to regulate the different type of service provision promote competition in 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 that sense so i think it's a it's a really important debate but i think there's nuances as well um in that 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 need to be taken into account thank you thank you ali uh, any thoughts uh, elizabeth and audrey would you like to comment on anything which uh, other participants mentioned or would you like to take up any other question Audrey, anything from you, uh, Mr. Sani? I think you want to raise another point. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, yeah. The point I wanted to raise is that uh, you know when you uh, 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 build these or design uh, such national uh, public digital platforms, uh, it is not uh, intended to keep people out. It's actually intended to ensure that competition is uh, fostered. Is you know we invite everyone it remains an open system it remains a system where new entities can come and dislodge uh, even the dominant ones and they get a fair opportunity to do that so it's actually the most open of the systems that one can create it's it's like uh, you know if i go to uh, uh, to uk and i want to drive Uh, i need to uh, comply with the uh, requirements uh, you know uh, that i i have to satisfy uh, uh, to have my driving license or to have a valid uh, you know driving license uh, in uk 
so it's uh, it's laying down that kind of rules of the road and i'm sure uh, that as gpi gpi uh, you know takes uh, further shape uh, that uh, common rules of the road uh, uh, would actually take shape uh, which uh, help us deal with these issues uh, you know in a responsible manner and uh, 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 do things in a manner that will add to the trust and confidence of the people if we do not add to the trust and confidence of the people in whatever we do uh, we are actually missing the opportunity to make best use of the uh, you know uh, immense uh, benefits that these technologies can bring us so uh, audrey i would also uh, like you to link up to the point which uh, mr sani raised and uh, these days I, i'm glad that he mentioned it because uh, right now in our meets we are seeing uh, heated controversies that the big tech companies are facing in different parts of the world in fact in the us in france a few weeks uh, earlier in australia and so on and so forth and you have been a part of the big tech uh, yourself so how does one look at this picture mr sani very rightly pointed out that unless we settle this issue on do we promote uh, big tech interests or do we look at the national interest but big tech the defenders of big tech also speak about how they have reached that position of dominance or monopoly by innovation by investments and so on and so forth so how would you like to settle this question since you have been a part of the big tech yourself in your earlier avatar uh yeah th thanks for the question and um and then I'll, i i do want to touch back on a point about open data and platforms but uh i think look i think that we're entering a a a time in in which uh technology overall is no longer a toy it's not a it's not a thing that's on the side anymore it's it's part of everything that we do and if you even a decade ago it was sort of in some ways a nice to have or uh, you know when i was at the oecd in 2007 for a year i you know i didn't have a laptop it wasn't a thing we didn't get laptops then and so it but it's it that's not the case anymore and and i think that governments and other stakeholders are are rightly questioning what is the right regulatory framework in a in a variety of areas including in competition um to to uh to make uh, technology broadly whether it's you know this general category that we think of as ai or whether it's data um how do we how do we make it serve the collective interests of all of our societies um and one of the things that's very important at the oecd in addition to the economic prosperity it's also social well-being and that's a very difficult thing to to measure what we do at the oecd is measure but how do we think about for example social well-being with regard to tech technology um and so i think governments are rightly questioning that i think the actions that they're taking reflect this um the concern both about the economic development and prosperity of all of our societies and countries and also about the well-being of their people and um i i can't comment on any specific measures taken but i think the technology companies are also from from where i said now uh hopefully taking that seriously and working constructively with governments to find solutions to both enable that continued innovation which we've seen to be hugely valuable to both our economies and to our well-being and in, and and its ability to enable our continued economic prosperity or at least economic recovery in times of crisis like covid and we have a lot of interesting data on how that's the case and how i think it will continue to be necessary and critically important to the economic recovery that we're about to continue to undergo as we 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 weather through this the continuation of this pandemic um so we need to be able to preserve that and enable that um uh while also um you know having having um it, it, having supporting societal well-being supporting um uh sort of fair uh, distribution across the world so i think um i think that the, the activities under underway both at the government level and at the industry level will hopefully get us there but you're absolutely correct there's a lot of a lot of concern and i think in in many cases the concern is reasonable um with regard to the to to data i just wanted to i think one of the things we've talked a little bit about but maybe less about and i was really glad that um that uh, mr sanri 
brought it up is, and, and that this context of this open platform, one of the big questions for artificial intelligence is, is access to data and how we get access to data, how we share data. Um, and this is an area where the OECD has worked for many years. I know it's an area where, where also industry, we've, uh, it's been a, a complicated, it's a complicated topic. Data is a complicated thing. It's not a this or that. It's, uh, it lives in different sort of dimensions. And uh, so I just wanna highlight uh, the importance of data governance overall and thinking about data governance, thinking about cross-border data flows, um, thinking about data localization and the impacts of certain policy actions on our ability to fuel technologies like artificial intelligence um, at, at a cooperative level or cross-border level. At the OECD, we work at the cross-border level. So we, we, we're, we're really interested in what happens among and between countries. Um, on that note, I would say one, one piece of work that's forth, hopefully forthcoming from the OECD is a recommendation on enhancing enhanced access to and sharing of data to provide this sort of framework on how um, data can be accessed and shared uh, better, not just personal data, getting out of the realm of, of solely personal data, but into the realm of other sorts of types of data that can enhance um, technology development, particularly artificial intelligence. We also have a, a recommendation recently or, or forthcoming on enhanced access to research data, which is obviously very important in times of pandemic, which, but also for artificial intelligence. And so I think we should, you know, we should also dive deep at some point um, in, in the governance of data and how it fuels artificial intelligence. And I suspect that uh, um, both the finance sector and the health sector have a lot to say about that topic. Um, and at, because in both situations, we have serious, it, they both have really regulated sectors, first of all, and um, we're dealing a lot in personal data, personal information of people, which we have to protect. And it's very interesting what India is doing, and I'm very interested to learn more about it. Um, but I did want to raise the data issue and point to a few potential forthcoming instruments from the OECD that might help us um, co construct a way to think about getting access to data and sharing it responsibly for the or the benefit of, of driving these technologies forward. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. And uh, I would request uh, Elizabeth, you must have heard uh, Mr. Sani mention that there are huge expectations of the GPA that you will set the rules of the road. And uh, how do you plan to do that? We have experiences of other multilateral bodies which are considered now to be very exclusionary and uh, they have all kinds of baggage with them. So what are your, uh, what is your thinking? How do you want to make this whole process more consultative, more participatory and uh, feel free to respond to any other point also raised. I must uh, also tell you that we have just four minutes left. So I'll give three minutes to you and I'll use the last minute to maybe give a quick summary. And then unfortunately we'll have to leave it at that. So Elizabeth, please uh, go ahead. Sure, and thank you very much again for uh, coming back to me on this. I, I think it's important to recognize that GPAY um, wasn't actually created to set the rules. That's not at all the intention of the um, governance of GPAY. I think what GPAY is meant to do is to uh, bring and, and collaborate around uh, the application of um, AI in the space where the rules are framed. So that, again, that sort of bridging between theory and practice. And, uh, and I think to help illustrate that um, and why I think that's very useful um, to the different points that were raised. The, um, there was a time in, in the earlier reflections on what GPA should be, um, where there was the thought that perhaps it could be a network of existing research. Um, activities. So instead of being separate bodies where researchers came together, the research uh, center in India, the research center in Paris, the research center in Canada and Singapore, etc., could be linked some way through this entity. And in fact, the founders decided that wasn't what they aspired to, and they pursued this model where research was were taken, leading researchers were taken from those different groups and, and brought together from the different stakeholders, from the different sector perspectives. And I think the value and interest in, in that is that you, you have something new there working 
in a new way they're working together. <clears throat> it's a collaboration that they collectively are responsible for. And I think their goals in all of the different groups from what I've seen so far are much more focused in sharing and using, <clears throat> forgive me, <coughs> I have a little scratch. They're sharing and using the information um, that they are able to uh, bring into the process and then creating something, a, a deeper collective understanding with it and benefiting and expediting and democratizing the use of that information and understanding. So um, I hope that's helpful in, in, in better understanding what GPA is and isn't. I think there are lots of other organizations working on rules as such. This will not be the pursuit of, of GPA. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying this, Elizabeth. And uh, finally, it's a very pleasurable duty to thank all the panelists for their uh, brilliant insights, perspectives. Two things are very clear. One, of course, uh, that we must have uh, good uh, protocols for uh, data sharing, for data collection, the need to be more citizen centric, look at national interests is definitely paramount. And uh, of course, I'm very glad that all, you, all of you spoke about the immense possibilities of uh, taking collaborations at the next level. And this is something which is extremely well aligned with our own philosophy here in Telangana. So while moderating the session, I'm delighted that I also learned quite a lot and which will benefit us in taking our journey forward. Once again, extremely grateful to all of you and uh, back to our host, Mr. Saurabh. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sri Jayesh Ranjanji, for I think uh, an excellent session. Your very incisive and pointed remarks uh, about issues surrounding AI governance, I think brought the best out of uh, all the panelists. And uh, it also brought to fore the fact that multiple stakeholders have a lot to contribute to AI. I must also point out here that the initiative of Telangana government to demystify AI and by declaring year 2020 as a uh, year of uh, AI is I think a great initiative. I also thank uh, uh, my secretary in government of India, uh, Shri Ajay Sahani ji. Uh, and uh, I think the talk he gave about national nationwide public data platforms, which we are very aggressively pursuing. And the fact that though there is a need for regulation, but government has a responsibility to foster innovation while creating an ecosystem that is both fair and reasonable and entices trust and confidence among the users. These are paramount. I also thank Ms. Irena Harbach for her talk about trustworthiness and value of AI to citizens. I would like to extend uh, my deep gratitude to Mr. Shami Kundu and uh, the, his thoughts about uh, business innovation and customer requirements and the balance that has to be maintained. I would like to thank Ms. Audrey Plonk uh, um, and uh, I think uh, some excellent uh, things that she talked about in terms of practicality that has to come in as part of governance and uh, how ecosystem has to be developed while we look at regulation. I would also finally thank uh, Ms. Elizabeth Thomas Reynaud. She's been uh, pioneering uh, the work of GPI and the leadership it is providing the global community. Uh, so I thank all the, the panelists once again, and that takes us to showcase session as part of uh, this today's uh, discussion. We have five country showcases lined up for the day. Uh, for the rest of the time. We have 30 minutes to go and we have uh, country showcases from India, Japan, Singapore, Germany, and Slovenia. And I believe uh, each of them have a presentation, either a video presentation or an audio video, uh, uh, a visual uh, PPT or a AV presentation. And may I request all of you to kindly stick to five minutes each for your presentation. So we would start with India and I request Dr. Ajay Gurk, who is a senior director in the Ministry of Electronics and also head of department for international cooperation, startups, innovation, to kindly make his uh, presentation. Dr. Gurg. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Joint Secretary Saurabhji, and to thank you for giving me this opportunity. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to all participating in this event. It is a great opportunity that we are coming forward to participate in a very important conference like this. For, as because why I say this is that as world moves from towards industry 4.0, where technologies like AI are becoming uh, are maturing, 
what we see is as india is that we are moving towards an era where digitalization is now a concept for all solving problems for all sectors of the economy rather than being a domain which gave a better experience to people for india under the digital india program or in under any initiative that we take on ai digital inclusion is the key and that is the reason we are very happy to be part of the gpi as we think that india can have a great role to play for giving the perspective of the developing world the digital india program or the ai strategy which talks about empowerment for all has and which secretary sani talked about the public digital platforms have the core is that the digital technologies should enable all including businesses which small or big including citizens and including all nations of the world to be participative in future digitalization world government of india has taken a conscious call that future technologies including ai have a, uh, have all stakeholders to play a key role the mighty startup hub where we are bringing the whole tech startup ecosystem onto a single platform the various center of excellences that we have established across the country which are 22 in number where uh, we are trying to see that how digitalization can play a key, key stellar role uh, are an examples where we are thinking of inclusive growth in the digital era in addition what i will say is that in under the gpi the core principles where innovation can drive solving problems for all the core 17 uh, uh, 17 strategic principles of the un to bring uh, inclusive society are our core principles on which we will interact under the gpi where, and see that regulatory and other challenges that are there for international community to uh, handle are uh, have the voice of all now i'll uh, because of the shortage of time i'll not go into much details but i'll just try to give you an a glimpse of what we are doing under the center of excellences so that ai is able to solve problems for all sector of economy may i request the um uh, organizers to please play the uh, video that i have on center of excellence thank you stpi steering mates initiatives on artificial intelligence poised to launch 25 centers of excellence 12 coes already launched software technology parks of india and autonomous society under ministry of electronics and it government of india drives innovative and entrepreneurship by establishing centers of excellence through a robust collaboration with government industry academia industry associations and funding partners two coes focused on ai and six coes leveraging ai in sector centric applications aligned with the vision of ministry of electronics and it stpi galvanizes its efforts to establish coes focused on ai to foster startups working on ai in sectors like healthcare education agriculture nlp smart mobility and transportation fintech and blockchain the pioneering stpi coes driving vision of mighty Image is a revolutionary initiative by STPI to nurture startups in AI, computer vision, gaming and VFX by providing world-class labs on AI and CV. Leading startups of Image are designing AI-powered personalized fitness apps, working on NLP-based smart document processing and building AI and CV-based applications for healthcare, e-commerce, agriculture and industrial automation solutions. Neuron is a groundbreaking initiative by STPI to foster startups in AI, big data, IoT and AVG. The advanced AI and big data labs differentiate Neuron from other COEs in India in nurturing promising startups to build AI-based solutions to address the challenges of bio-waste and solve industrial issues by building AI and ML-based automation applications to revolutionize Industry 4.0 era. Var COE focuses on a wide range of industries and research fields including education, healthcare, skill development, architecture, 
transportation, construction, tourism and entertainment. This COE is nurturing startups to develop AI-driven AR and VR applications to bolster education sector. Motion revolutionizes the automotive industry by strengthening R&D, innovation, product development and IP creation in the areas of autonomous, connected, electric, shared, ACES mobility space, focused on building AI-powered smart mobility solutions. One startup of this COE is working on identifying fatigue and distraction through facial and eye movement scans while considering safety of individual and commercial drivers. MedTech COE at Lucknow has developed a robust ecosystem to harness emerging technologies, foster innovation and nurture startups in medical electronics and healthcare informatics to further strengthen government initiatives such as Make in India and Digital India while leveraging the potential of AI. This COE has a special focus on AI-based medical imaging, screening and predictive modeling to accelerate diagnostic process. STPI has set up FinBlue to provide comprehensive ecosystem that ensures the fintech startups leverage mentorship by industry stalwarts, domain and technology experts. Labs, leading startups in this COE are working on AI and NLP based solutions to automate insurance claim processing and regulatory compliance. Apiary COE brings in transformative changes in blockchain innovation in agriculture, e-governance, supply chain and finance by leveraging AI, ML and data analytics. Startups of this COE can play a path-breaking role in developing innovative blockchain apps by using AI for e-governance in agriculture sectors. Octane encourages R&D, innovation, entrepreneurship in areas of IoT in agriculture, Animation, Emerging Tech ARVR, IT in Healthcare, GIS and Drone Tech, Graphics Designing, Data Analytics and Gaming Technology. In the first phase, STPI has launched three COEs focused on IoT in Agriculture, Animation and Emerging Tech ARVR, which will focus on AI-powered solutions. Aligned with the vision of the Ministry of Electronics and IT, STPI COEs can bring in transformative changes by nurturing startups to develop groundbreaking products, create IPR and address the future challenges of industry and society at large, while providing the much needed platform to develop AI-based solutions for various sectors on top of other emerging technologies. Come and join STPI Centers of Excellence to transform your brilliant ideas into groundbreaking innovations in emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence. Yeah, thank you so much. So this was a peek into the uh, Center of Excellence led uh, AI innovation ecosystem that uh, Government of India is engaged with. Now that takes me to the next uh, country, which is showcasing its uh, AI governance regime which will be Japan. And may I request Mr. Ida Yoichi and Mr. Huma Yoichi to please make their presentation. Over to you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Gawa. Uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, 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 the uh, Honorable uh, Secretary Sony and the distinguished speakers and the colleagues from India and from all over the world, uh, it, it, uh, it is our great pleasure and honor uh, to, to join uh, all of you today. And so uh, let us uh, introduce our uh, uh, efforts uh, uh, at home uh, in, uh, in uh, country. Uh, with regard to the national uh, policy making, uh, as well as uh, our international efforts to, to promote uh, international discussions in uh, international uh, fora. So let me uh, first invite my colleague, Mr. Homma, uh, to introduce uh, our uh, efforts uh, on, uh, on the national uh, policy making. And I will follow uh, him uh, to introduce our international efforts. So Mr. Homma, please. Hi, uh, thank you uh, uh, for introducing me, my dear colleague, Ida-san. And thank you, uh, 
All right, to thank the team for giving me the opportunity to explain the initiatives of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. Here in NAFTA MIC regarding a policy. Uh, okay. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening for everybody attending this excellent global AI summit. Uh, my name is Luigi Homa. Uh, I'm the principal researcher of the Institute for Information and Communication Policy here in NAFTA IICT of MIC and uh, principal secretariat staff of the conference toward AI Network Society of MIC. Uh, please refer to my bio later in the last slide of the material if you are interested in it. Uh, then I will explain the conference toward AI Network Society of MIC. Okay, let's move on to the slides. Please look at the slide, page one. Uh, the Conference to the Internet Society is a multi-stakeholder conference established in October 2016 and hosted by IICT. The purpose of the conference is to examine the matters related to social, economic, ethical, and legal issues toward promoting AI networking in the entire society. The conference is chaired by Professor Sam Sudo. Now he is the expert member of GPA. OECD-1 AI and the UNESCO AHEC, et cetera, from Japan. The main initiatives performed by the conference are formulating the AI R&D guidelines in July 2017 and the AI utilization guidelines in August 2019, and also releasing 2020 report in July this year. I will explain these initiatives briefly. First, uh, the AI R&D guidelines compile principles which are expected to be considered in AI development by AI developers, along with comment on the guidelines. Please refer to the slide page four later, which explains the overview of the AI R&D guidelines. Next, the uh, AI utilization guidelines compile uh, principles which are expected to be considered in AI utilization by AI users, along with comment on the guidelines. Please refer to the slide page five later, which explains the overview of the AI utilization guidelines. Next, uh, please look at the slide page two, go back to uh, page two. Uh, this slide shows the relationship between the social principles of a human-centric AI and the AI R&D guidelines and the AI utilization guidelines. The social principles of human-centered AI was adopted in March 2019 by the Integrated Innovation Strategy Promotion Council in Japan, which is hosted, hosted by the Cabinet Secretariat. The structure of social principles of human-centered AI is like pyramid formation. Uh, and the, at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, 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 section 4.2 of the principle is the R&D and the utilization principles of AI, uh, which means developers and the business operators of AI should establish and comply with the AI development and utilization principles. And then each developer or a business operator is encouraged to establish AI development and utilization principles. And to establish AI development and utilization principles for each developer or business operator, practical guidance to be different is needed. Therefore, our AI R&D guidelines and AI utilization guidelines are expected to be referred as a practical guidance for each developer or business operator to formulate its own principles. In this sense, our uh, AI R&D and the AI utilization guidelines are compiled as non-regulatory and non-binding soft law. In addition, these, these guidelines are consistent with international discussion, such as those at OECD. Mr. Yoichi, you have two more minutes. Um, okay, just... yeah. Also, uh, yes. Uh, I want to uh, explain uh, the 2020, uh, 2020 report uh, released uh, this um, July. Uh, let's go on to the skip to the slide page seven. Okay, uh, I don't have enough time to explain the entire slides regarding uh, 2020 report. 
I briefly explain the uh, main characteristics of it. First, based on the classification of dated entity which is explained in the slide page six, initiatives necessary for each related entity that are discussed and organized. Uh, second, uh, secondly, we put great importance to hear best practices of various AI-related entities. It is important to discuss related issues, not, abs not, not abstractly, but based on various and concrete use cases. Third, because they are related businesses are performed uh, globally, it is necessary to follow the trends of overseas and international organizations and to be consistent with international discussions. Uh, finally, uh, the conference to the Neto Society of MIC will continue to discuss various issues to promote trustworthy social implementation of AI based on best practices. Uh, this time, I appreciate having the opportunity to introduce the initiatives of uh, MIC regarding air policy, and also it was very nice to hear the presentation from India. And also looking forward to hearing various in initiatives from countries attending here. Thank you for listening to my uh, English presentation, and please keep in touch with us to promote trustworthy social implementation of AI. Then please move on to the presentation of Ida san. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I, I will be very brief. Uh, so uh, for the international uh, uh, efforts, uh, we proposed, made a proposal on international discussion uh, on AI principles uh, in the year of 2016, when we hosted G7 uh, ICT ministers meeting. At the same time, we proposed uh, international discussion uh, to OECD because we believed that uh, this kind of uh, discussion should be uh, con uh, should be uh, done continuously and uh, uh, we need uh, uh, some uh, high expertise by uh, experts uh, uh, from international uh, organization so two work streams uh, went in parallel and the uh, uh, discussion at uh, g7 was uh, succeeded by italian colleagues and then canadian and the French colleagues, and this uh, work uh, uh, led to the establishment of GPI. And the uh, discussion at OECD uh, uh, led to the uh, uh, recommendation uh, on AI uh, in the year of 2019. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, this uh, recommendation was also uh, utilized in the discussion uh, at G20 when uh, Japan hosted the G20 uh, presidency. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, worked uh, together with Indian colleagues and the colleagues from other uh, countries to, to agree on G20 AI principles. So I skip three slides and go to final page. So uh, actually the G20 AI principles is a copy from the uh, OECD principles. And uh, we proposed uh, to, to agree on, this, uh, uh, on these principles. And uh, let me uh, introduce my uh, pr uh, personal experience uh, uh, based on the uh, uh, permission by e uh, colleagues from India. Uh, the India was uh, first uh, reluctant to agree on this uh, on these principles, and uh, uh, I asked for advices from uh, uh, honourable uh, secretary uh, uh, Mr. Sony and also other colleagues from Indian government. And the reason was uh, India was still discussing uh, internally uh, the national AI policy and the strategy, and they were reluctant to to make commitment to the international agreement. The G20 uh, recommendation and the draft G, uh, uh, draft G20 uh, uh, principle included uh, the recommendation to national government uh, as section two. So uh, we uh, changed the wording in the draft uh, from uh, support to take note for uh, section two and keep uh, the support uh, for section one. So we we made a kind of differentiation between section one and section two. And in the end, uh, all the countries uh, agreed 
to 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 take up uh, the G20 AI principles, and we we were very happy to to bring this up to national leaders uh, summit, and the G20 agreement was agreed by leaders. So uh, it was the history of the international discussion. We are very happy to to collaborate with uh, uh, India and other colleagues. And uh, we hope uh, to continue our uh, collaboration. And uh, thank, and you, thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Team Japan, for your inputs. And we look forward to further collaboration. That takes me to the next country that we have, which is Singapore. And uh, I request Mr. Sang how to kindly make the presentation. Thank you. Uh, greetings from Singapore. Um, My name is Sang Hao. I am from um, Infocom Media to introduce uh, how Singapore governance. Okay, our AI governance regime is actually part of our overall national national AI strategy, which was launched uh, last year in November. So it is part of the ecosystem enabler to um, achieve the uh, vision of short, what does our AI governance uh, um, approach look like? It is, even, it is essentially an industry self-regulation with a lot of government guidance and with a lot of collaboration between industry, um, academia, civic society, as well as the public sector. And let me just uh, briefly expand on this. So the first thing we did um, uh, to, uh, 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 in terms of AI governance is to set up an industry-led advisory council on the ethical use of AI and data. So what does this council do? This council uh, are industry captains. They are uh, 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 represented both in local companies as well as international companies. Um, they identify issues uh, uh, um, arising out of commercial deployment of AI um, that may require government policy or regulatory intervention, and they will provide uh, a sounding board to government. And they being the industry captains, they also bring the message of re uh, responsible use of AI back to their industry. So this is in short what the advisory council is doing. So some of the um, issues of uh, uh, confronting AI governance uh, require long, longer term research. So for example, um, the autonomous vehicle liability framework or uh, financial policy. So uh, for these more um, uh, complicated um, issues that require deeper dive, uh, we commissioned um, um, our, uh, a research program in one of our uh, local institution, uh, Institute of Higher Learning. So um, uh, Singapore Management uh, University School of Law set up a center for AI governance and data use. So the focus is to um, identify um, potential legal, ethical, and policy issues confronting longer term AI uh, problems and uh, work on it uh, uh, in partnership with both government as well as private sector so that the output of this research would be uh, commercially as well as uh, uh, relevant as well as relevant to um, the public policy makers. Then what does the government do? Um, uh, since 2019, uh, we published a model AI governance framework, which essentially translates a high level principles such as explainability, transparency, fairness, human centricity and safety. All these are familiar principles on international platforms. What we did is we translate them into implementable practices covering the full range of deployment of AI applications. So um, companies deploying AI would know how to uh, do so responsibly. We did not uh, do this alone. In fact, um, we involved uh, multiple consultations, both with local industries in Singapore, as well as internationally. So we conducted workshops in San Francisco, and we also approached uh, quite a few regulators um, in the world um, to, to provide feedback. So this document um, is in its second iteration. The second edition was uh, recently released in Davos um, uh, in January this year. 
So apart from um, the model AI governance framework that translates uh, principles into practical measures, we also partner a World Economic Forum uh, Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution in San Francisco to jointly develop an assessment guide so that companies know whether their implementation, their governance um, uh, uh, measures are aligned uh, with um, the model AI governance framework. So this one also went through a, a extensive consultation with both uh, private sector academia as well as civic society. Um, uh, we consulted over 60 uh, organizations. So uh, apart from um, these two documents, uh, we also encourage companies, um, local, international, uh, from various sectors to share with us their implementation of responsible AI so that these implementations can be used to inspire other companies worldwide to do so. So we published the compendium of use cases initially featuring some a dozen of uh, organizations and then we are um, um, uh, preparing the second edition of the compendium. So this is my last slide. Um, in terms of uh, 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 AI governance initiatives, we have a base of uh, uh, documents and then we are using these ba uh, as a basis uh, to uh, promote responsible AI for among the professionals, among the organizations, as well as to contribute uh, to international discussion in terms of having a responsible uh, ethical AI systems. So in these um, uh, various aspects, we invite, um, we are happy to work with uh, like-minded countries uh, to further ethical AI. So um, I hope that I keep to my five minute presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hao. Mr. Hao is the Deputy Director AI Governance in Singapore. And uh, we look forward to learning from Singapore as we go ahead with our, with our national program on AI. Uh, that takes me to the next country whom we have uh, the, in the country showcase session, which is Germany. And Germany is represented today by Mr. Andreas Horton. He is the head of division AI strategy um, on AI, data economy, and blockchain in the Federal Republic of Germany. So over to you, Mr. Andreas. Well, thank you very much, uh, Saurabh, for uh, having me. It's a pleasure and honor to represent Germany in this formidable conference. Salutations from my Director General, Stefan Schnorr, who could not attend on short notice, but I'm really happy to be here. Now, we learned a lot and AI can contribute to solve global problems. I think this is clear and also to achieve the United Nations uh, sustainable development goals. So thank you very much for contributing to that. And thanks to the Indian government and congratulations for this conference. Now, as you indicated, I'm uh, asked to give a short presentation on the state of play regarding AI in Germany. Now, according to a recent study we conducted, only 6% of companies in Germany are utilizing AI technologies in their processes uh, or services. Uh, to be a bit pointed, we think that Germany is good in science and research, but we're not so good in the take up of AI. So this is why um, we already in 2018 adopted a government strategy. In the drafting process, we conducted six expert workshops. We had a broad online consultation with 95 uh, participants um, uh, contributing. The government announced to invest additional 3 billion euros in the time period from 2019 by 2025. Now, because of the pandemic, um, the government agreed on a uh, stimulus package. And uh, so another 2 billion euros will be uh, spent by 2025. So a total of 5 billion euros on AI additional to uh, other uh, digitization investments. Now, what's, what's the main theme of the, our strategy? Um, our motto is AI made in Germany. But to be very clear, uh, our strategy is a German strategy, but of course, it's a European approach. We uh, are in line with the European uh, approach and we share European values and want to promote European values in AI. We think that Germany can uh, contribute a lot with German engineering and uh, this is the, the, the narrative of, of uh, our strategy. We uh, chose a broad definition of AI, um, including symbolic AI, not only machine learning, and our strategy is horizontal. We did not pick specific sectors and promote them. 
we said that we need the whole economy to be an AI economy in the long term. So that also was very important for us. The objectives are threefold. So of course we want to be Germany and Europe to be a leading center for AI and thus help to, uh, to safeguard Germans, uh, Germany's and Europe's uh, competitiveness in the future. We also want, and this refers to my previous speaker from Singapore, also a responsible development and use of AI. I come later back to that uh, when I refer to the European activities a bit. And we thirdly will integrate AI into society, a bit referring to what Yuichi-san reflected on the Japanese uh, Society 5.0 uh, aspect. And we want a broad societal dialogue and active and activating political measures. We have 12 fields of action ranging from research and development, innovation, uh, transfer of knowledge into application startups, but also work and qualification um, administrative uh, take up, but also governance and the regulatory framework standardization, which we think is a very important issue also for international cooperation, but also in general, international cooperation is very important. And of course, societal dialogue. Maybe just quickly pick some of the um, major uh, measures we, we Im are implementing. In the field of research and development, we um, strengthened our national network of uh, research uh, networks, and we are currently um, funding at least 12 centers of expertise and also application hubs. We announced that we want 100 new professorships, which is very ambitious, but we're trying to do that. And we established an agency for breakthrough innovations comparably to what DARPA is doing in the US in the uh, civil field. Of course, for us as Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, transfer into the economy is very important. And we try to support that with an online map with best cases we identified. We set up an AI training uh, course at our um, SME um, competence centers. We have 26 throughout the whole nation. And SMEs can practice with AI there in, uh, in the, the competence centers. And we conducted innovation challenges, application oriented. We already had three calls and the aim is to um, support application oriented technology research funding in order to establish sector specific ecosystems of AI in Germany. Qualification and work is very important. And I, I really remember very well my meeting with uh, one of the masterminds of India's strategy, Anna Roy. Um, uh, previous year in Germany, and we had a long debate on qualification and work. We set up a German observatory for artificial intelligence in work and society. We also um, had a AI specific section in our national further training strategy, and we adopted a skilled labor strategy in digitization. And of course, we are working on, uh, on integrating AI and digital, digital technologies into our vocational training system. Now, the aspect of dialogue, just to highlight two, uh, two, two uh, initiatives, um, we set up a digital work and society future fund, which aims at promoting multidisciplinary so social technology design. So multi-stakeholders can come there together and are supported with funds to set up projects. And together with the Ministry of Research and Education, we set up a platform learning systems which enables the dialogue between research businesses and politics. Now, our strategy is a learning strategy and we are currently developing further uh, the strategy in line with the status of the debate and the needs now two years after the adoption. And this strategy 1.1 will, uh, will be adopted soon. Um, what I think is very important that we're currently working on a national data strategy, which of course also relates to AI very much. Just quickly on European, uh, the European Commission submitted an AI white paper. Our government submitted written comments and there will be a broad debate ahead also on the regulatory framework. And we are expecting the European Commission to submit proposals for the legal framework in the first quarter of 2021. Lastly, international cooperation it was said so much about OECD G7 from Ambassador Henri Verdier, but also from Anna Plonk, uh, uh, Audrey Plonk, Elizabeth uh, Yuichi-san. 
Let me just highlight, concluding my presentation, that we really appreciate India, India's leadership. And we are excited to work together also with India in the global partnership of, on artificial intelligence. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Hardin. I'm sorry I had to rush you up a little, but uh, some of the things that you said are finding great deal of consonance in our pursuit as we uh, roll out our national program. And uh, it was great engaging with you. Uh, that takes me to the final country showcase for the day, which is uh, from Slovenia. And Slovenia is represented by Mr. Marko Grobelnik. He's the rep country representative in OECD, CHAI, and GPI. He's also the co-founder of UNESCO International Research Center. So over to you, Mr. Grubelnik. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so uh, I will have a, a brief presentation. I have a couple of slides. Uh, let me just share the uh, uh, screen. Uh, uh, OK. Uh, uh, just uh, briefly, so yeah, <clears throat> I, I appear in a couple of roles, uh, among others, I'm digital champion of Slovenia, uh, um, and uh, the rest, I guess, I will, uh, I will um, uh, say during the presentation. So first, Slovenia, you know, many people don't know where Slovenia is. It's a small country uh, in the Central Europe, right, uh, between Alps and uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea. We are only two million, right? One of the safest countries and member of uh, all uh, of the Europe's uh, there are many Europe's uh, um, and um, now uh, first uh, since we talk about AI right uh, so where Slovenia stands on a global uh, AI uh, landscape uh, so let me show just a, a brief uh, picture from uh, OECD AI policy Observ observatory so this is the uh, picture uh, taken from the observatory, but uh, let me uh, uh, try to show you this uh, live, right? So if this is a global picture of, uh, uh, actually, this is not the global one. Uh, 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 this is the global <clears throat> picture in absolute terms, right? How AI evolved through through the years, right? More to the right, more developed AI it is, right? Uh, uh, in that particular country, you see USA, EU, obviously China and India, uh, like four fronts. Slovenia is somewhere back there. But now, if we uh, put this in the perspective of per capita, right? So then suddenly uh, Slovenia becomes a little bit more uh, visible. So let me just move the time ahead. So Slovenia would be somewhere there as uh, uh, Germany uh, per capita in uh, terms of production of um, uh, AI. So this would be uh, in this more like European uh, circle, right? Um, so why I'm showing this because uh, we are one of the major contributors to this uh, OECD observatory and um, it's always nice to uh, look at it. Now going further, right? So how big is this AI in Slovenia? So we have pretty long tradition from early 70s, uh, having AI research on uh, several academic institutions. So this is from the time when AI was not even known uh, to the broader public. We have roughly 400 AI researchers in AI and robotics, which, well, for the country of 200 pe uh, 2 million people actually is pretty decent. So we have one AI researcher per 5,000 inhabitants, which, well, in the modern terms where everybody's measuring uh, um, uh, infections, right? Uh, so how many infections per 100,000 people? So we have like 20 AI infected people per 100,000 inhabitants, which, uh, 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 well, in this COVID-19 terms, this would be mildly, mildly uh, infected uh, 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 country, right? Uh, in this case for uh, AI. So uh, what's, uh, what makes us strong, I think, is that uh, all, really, all computer science students uh, in a country go through AI courses for last 30 years. And uh, in that sense, we have very well educated uh, engineering population. Of course, country is small, right? But uh, um, uh, still it's a fairly concentrated uh, AI. So this is just one picture. I won't go into the detail. details. So this is a Slovenian AI landscape. Uh, so pretty much everybody who who is relevant is uh, on this picture, since the country is small, we can still afford making the complete picture, right, of the country um, uh, AI. So this would include the companies, academia, and other organizations. 
Okay, now uh, <clears throat> international Slovenian AI participation. So one 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 thing which I would uh, uh, emphasize is this recently established International Research Center for AI under uh, auspices of uh, UNESCO. Um, so this was recently established is the only center UNESCO AI center of that kind. Uh, and the mission is to develop good AI in the global space. Uh, we have also uh, the only UNESCO AI chair, uh, John Shaw Taylor, which is uh, uh, joint, uh, has joint position at UCL and uh, our uh, uh, Joseph Stefan Institute. Then uh, we have, uh, I think, fairly strong, OECD was mentioned in uh, today a lot, but still, uh, I think I would like to emphasize this. Uh, we have very active role uh, in the former AI Go and now in the uh, ongoing uh, OECD One AI, as mentioned before. So we are one of the major contributors of this OECD AI policy observatory. Uh, 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 just watch this uh, website uh, in the next uh, months or two, uh, a lot of new things will happen there. So basically this uh, is a, well, we try to make it as a central point uh, to observe evolution of AI as it happens. So in pretty much real time. So uh, I was chairing last year, the working group on OECD AI definition, which I think is still uh, maybe one of the most uh, comprehensive AI definitions, uh, which is out there and many countries actually are using it. Um, and uh, now uh, I'm also, let's say, chairing uh, uh, the working group, uh, co-chairing uh, on AI classification, which I think will be also very interesting view to what AI actually is, right? Uh, apart from this, we are members of GPI, <clears throat> maybe uh, the smallest country in the funding members, uh, uh, which is okay. Uh, uh, we have leading role in Council of Europe Committee on AI. So this is this Kahai. Uh, uh, so uh, Gregor Stoyin, one of my uh, colleagues here from Slovenia, is a uh, chair of Kahai, and also UN uh, Committee on AI. So as part of this digital cooperation panel. So these are this would be kind of quick summary of our international uh, activities. Now, uh, of course, as every other, uh, as Andreas was uh, telling um, in presentation before, we have our own national AI program. Now, uh, we have a couple of priorities like Slovenian language, obviously, uh, health, smart manufacturing, and public administration. Um, um, so on the topic of AI. Now, uh, of course, AI today, it's a game of the big guys, uh, of the big tech. Uh, um, and uh, so strategically, we need to position ourselves on the topics where we can compete, where we are not just a follow, uh, just followers, right? And um, so AI today we have a like I would say narrow AI, very powerful, but uh, solving narrow problems. In the future, we can expect that this will get broadened and the AI will evolve, right? So uh, uh, our investments will go most likely in the areas like this complex systems, common sense reasoning, and a couple of other uh, areas which will charter AI uh, in the next uh, 10 years. Just uh, uh, to uh, finish, I will just highlight one project which uh, we are working on here in Slovenia. So this is uh, something which uh, we call country digital twin. Uh, to automate this situational awareness for uh, digital governance. Uh, maybe uh, uh, just a couple of lessons from COVID uh, crisis recently, right? Uh, what we did we learn? Uh, so first, speed of decision-making increased. Uh, current uh, e-governments or governments uh, are not prepared for the speed of decision-making which needs to be there. Adaptation to new situation became, uh, became total necessity, uh, but of course, again, governments are typically slow in uh, adapting, right? Then uh, solving, we, can, we are good in like solving, let's say isolated issues, but we don't have a, a, a holistic view to the, uh, what's actually happening in a, in a complex system like a country. Uh, uh, so this is one, um, uh, and understanding all the societal consequences. Data support, uh, well, everybody has data, but it's not integrated, right? And technology, well, funny enough, it's available, but it's not used on critical spots. So this leads us, uh, leads us to, well, uh, decision what to do so that AI actually would help the country um, uh, to operate better also in this uh, COVID uh, crisis. So uh, uh, just to quickly uh, show, so there's, 
fairly established term, situational awareness, right? Which many people are using or many organizations, but this process is basically manual, right? So now our goal is to automate completely the, the cycle. So from perception, which is usually there, but comprehension is totally manual at the moment and projection uh, and uh, 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 projection of this uh, comprehension, uh, it's also totally manual. So the point is to automate this comprehension and projection. So uh, country level digital twins, uh, beyond uh, just occasional informal announcements, we are not aware of any other country having a digital twin. Uh, key reasons, basically it's, uh, the problem is too complex in terms of integrated real-time real data complexity of a government. Everybody knows the governments are way too complex, legal constraints and re risks and fears, I would say, for privacy and ethics. So uh, our strategy is, well, uh, the, the, the term, don't waste a good crisis. Now we have a good crisis and let's use it to, um, to build something uh, which uh, we could say a digital twin, which would allow actually country to monitor and uh, for decision policy makers, right, uh, to, to act in real time, which today basically it's close to impossible. Here's just, uh, uh, this is really the last slide. Uh, uh, basically our goal, and this is already functioning to some degree in near real time. So this means on a daily basis, right, uh, to, uh, to intercon interconnect data on the fly, right, across many different sectors, which includes health, pharmacies, uh, stores, right, economic data in real time, supply chain, transport, telecommunication, media, and also informal information from uh, the country, and all on the top of more traditional statistical uh, data. Problem, so this, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Conclude. yeah. Uh, this is my last, uh, my last uh, sentence. So basically, this would be kind of quick, quick presentation of uh, what we do uh, in the country, uh, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much, Mr. Grobelnik. I think uh, some of the things you said were very fascinating, especially in terms of the fact that uh, you talked about AI infestation in, in the country, which was remarkable. So uh, friends, that brings us to the conclusion of this session um, on the country showcase. And like all good things must come to an end, we are now today at the last day of the uh, race summit also. Uh, but uh, some of the key thoughts from this session to my mind are that the way forward in AI requires large scale transformational interventions in technologies and sectors, in data access, privacy and trust regimes, in ethics frameworks, in scaling people. And obviously a lot of it has to do um, through collaborative effort between uh, government and private sector. The event, uh, this race 2020 event has given us an opportunity to proliferate the adoption of AI in a socially responsible and ethically conscious manner. I thank all the keynote speakers, the panel uh, discussion participants, as well as the country showcase representatives for making this a very fruitful session for all of us. I would uh, now take leave of all of you. It was a very pleasant duty of mine to be able to conduct this session uh, with you. And uh, in the end, I urge the global community of professionals in emerging technologies, as well as other technology enthusiasts to remain engaged with the, uh, with the remaining sessions during the rest of the day. And I'm sure take some of the key learnings um, forward as we go ahead in our endeavor to make AI ubiquitous in our daily lives. Thank you so much. Good time, all of you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you.